Hello, everyone. Welcome to Las Vegas. Um, my name is Matt Fuselier, and today with Amy, we are going to talk to you about distributed solar systems at EDF and how we build a data acquisition system with the use of AWS IoT. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Amy Lindsay, and I'm a product owner at EDF Renewables, uh, focusing on solar and IoT. Uh, so, of course, today I hope you'll leave this room having understood how we implemented AWS IoT, uh, but I also hope you'll have seen how a proof of concept can deliver a clear roadmap towards business value um, and how AWS ProServe helped us in that process for agility and speed. Um, so, the agenda uh, to, of this talk is going to be quite classical. Uh, I'll start with an introduction and a problem definition, then Matt will take over the technical solution and then uh, I'll close with some lessons learned and uh, business results. Um, as a reminder to everybody here, uh, this presentation will be available both on SlideShare as a PDF and as a recording on YouTube a few days after the event. Uh, so EDF Renewables um, is the subs renewable subsidiary of a French utility, uh, EDF. Uh, we develop, build, and operate renewable assets around the world in over 20 countries. Uh, those assets can be both wind, solar, and storage. We have over 12 gigawatts installed and almost two gigawatts in the pipeline. Uh, our historical strongholds are in Europe and in Northern America. And although today, of course, the focus is going to be around how we implemented managed IoT services, I thought I would take this opportunity to talk a bit around uh, what digital transition means for a large company like us that's in multiple geographical regions and uh, operating a variety of assets. So uh, we are in the process of building a common uh, cloud-based digital platform uh, at EDF Renewables uh, that's there to address uh, some industry-wide challenges. Uh, several of them uh, you probably have already heard of. The first one is the decentralization of energy and the fact that consumers are becoming prosumers. They want information on the energy that they're using and on the assets that they own. And so we believe that we need to set ourselves up towards that future where we need to service and give information to all these end customers through a microservice approach. We also need to increase our agility. Uh, the rate of change to technical adoption has increased tremendously over the past years. And so we acknowledge that and we want to be able to test out new services much faster than we did in the past. And the last challenge is the one that will probably echo or resonate with the most people in the room today, uh, which is the fact that we need to break down the silos of both data and knowledge base. And so we are doing that by trying to provide transparency at the group level on the performance of our assets and on the processes that allow us to track that performance. Uh, to deliver this first core platform, we adopted a flavor of the scaled agile framework, which has given us three things. Uh, the first thing is um, it gives us products that are centered on value creation uh, for the business. Uh, it also gives us alignment across the enterprise and transparency at the enterprise level. But there are four key pillars uh, to uh, digital transformation success, uh, we think, and it's platform, process, products, and people. Uh, the first one, uh, platform, is something that we've uh, started to develop. The process, we've got a process that's been defined for the intake of new products, and we are developing multiple products. But the last part is really key, and that's the people side of things. And um, it's quite challenging to have the organizational change within the company so that the people are aligned and in a place where they can deliver a maximum value on the first three uh, parts. So now that I've talked about what uh, my, my take on digital transformation is, um, I'm going to go more into the deep side of the problem definition and why we're looking at IoT uh, to solve our solar data acquisition. Um, so data challenges on solar assets are quite numerous. Um, there's the first fact that they are geographically distributed. They suffer from unreliable connectivity. We are operating a diverse portfolio by the fact that we have both owned assets and third party assets on which we perform operations and maintenance. So we've got a variety of physical devices, asset layouts, data stores that we need to connect to, and communication protocols that we need to operate with. 
And finally, data quality is really critical because for solar assets, underperformance detection really relies on cross data source analysis and algorithms that are built upon that. We also need this data acquisition system to be scalable, so something that would work for both our large scale commercial and industrial rooftops, all the way to our hundreds of gigawatts of utility scale assets um, in a reasonable finance, at a reasonable financial cost point. Um, while not compromising our cybersecurity requirements. So this uh, schema shows an example of all the data generating devices that you would find commonly on a solar asset. In pink is the first level or the lower level of the data generating devices. So you'll find here the solar inverters, the panel temperature sensors, the weather station, or the substation, substation relay monitoring system. There are a lot of assets that we operate that already have a data aggregator of some sort on site, which is basically a communication hub that exposes data to the utility or to a SCADA or to a data historian. But what's important to realize on this, on this diagram is that there's a, multiplicity, a variety of communication protocols. We've got Modbus in some places, sometimes proprietary communication protocols. DNP3 is what we're going to see a lot as well in our utility world. Um, and so we need to be able to deal with this variety of communication protocols. And also on our solar assets, they have a wide number of SCADA systems that have been implemented uh, throughout all these assets with no unique way or common way of actually setting the SCADA up. And so to be a bit provocative, I would say that the SCADA sometimes turns out to be a very expensive data acquisition system on some of our assets. So in order to root this proof of concept very firmly in uh, the business use case we were trying to solve, we uh, used a very common Amazon methodology that they use throughout their company, which is the working backwards methodology. So we started off by defining what the business use case was before looking at the technical solution. We started off with uh, some interviews of key business users to uh, come up with a mock press release and frequently asked question. Uh, then we had a three-day workshop in Seattle with AWS ProServe, where we defined what the target architecture of our solution would be. And we followed that with the feature refinement, where we would trace the line in the sand between what was the realm of the proof of concept and what was the long-term solution we were targeting for. And thanks to that, we would have a prioritized backlog uh, that we had going into our five-week proof of concept where we demonstrated end-to-end -end ingestion from a solar asset all the way to our cloud, uh, all the while using ag an agile delivery framework. So it really accelerated our time to delivery of an end-to-end -end solution, and it allowed us to build up our internal skill sets while we used the expertise of AWS teams. Uh, to further a little bit more my comments around uh, uh, driving the proof of concept to specific business outcomes, at the top here, you have an extract of the mock press release frequently asked questions that you'll be able to uh, look at uh, on the slide share, for example. Uh, but I want to just focus a bit more on the sample user stories at the bottom from the workshop. And so they uh, relate to the experiences of a site manager, a performance analytics engineer, or a SCADA engineer, and how we envision that they would be using this system of both hardware and software. And so there are a few key words that I would just like to point out because you're going to hear them uh, throughout Matt's overview of the technical solution, which are that we need clean data, information on data quality, normalized data, uh, an easy way of onboarding new gateways, and we're really wanting to try and get more information on uh, closer to real time um, status of our assets. So now that I have painted the picture of the business use case and what we were trying to solve. I'll let Matt take it from here and go over the technical solution. Thank you, Amy. All right. Um, I did a final review of the slide this morning with one of the copy editor next door, and um, she made me uh, realize that the title of the session started with distributed solar systems at EDF. And um, so I want to apologize if there's any rocket scientists or people in the room that were hoping that we would talk about star systems and planets, but I think Amy made it pretty clear, um, and we might, have, we might have maybe changed the title a little earlier on if we've, if we've realized um, that we're talking about uh, renewable solar assets. So as Amy mentioned, EDF engaged with professional services um, to go through the whole cycle from the working backwards 
uh, design workshop, architecture and implementation of the solution. Um, EDF uh, decided to focus on their non-utility scale asset to get, uh, to get started. So think of it as you know, medium-sized solar farm, something that's bigger than uh, a few solar panels on the roof, but um, smaller than you know, a square mile of uh, solar panels here in the Nevada desert. Anything in between, um, which really gives us another challenge, which was to focus on um, the, the, the cost efficiency of the solution, being able to deploy something that financially makes sense on those assets uh, that, that might not produce a lot of electricity. Um, the needs from EDF were really to improve transparency uh, and availab availability of the data to solve um, two challenges. First of all, improve the operational e efficiency. Uh, think of it as, uh, for example, responding faster and more efficiently to an issue or an alert, or doing preventative maintenance to avoid a uh, site going down for an extended period of time, as well as generating new value out of the data that we're collecting. So uh, think of complex analysis that can be done on the data, cross data sources, and maybe make recommendation on what type of hardware or what type of optimi optimized configuration we might use for a site that gets deployed in Ontario versus Nevada, for example. Um, and that, that generates uh, additional business value for, for EDF. So AWS has, a, has many services. A few of them um, fo a little more focused on the IoT space. So if you are looking at implementing an IoT project similar to what we're going to describe today or even different, I invite you to go check out our services on the website. Uh, if you want to go and implement that on your own, you're absolutely uh, free to do that. And if you need help going through that process, we have a whole ecosystem of partner as well as um, AWS professional services teams that can help you out. So. Uh, feel free to reach out, that's, uh, that's what we're here for. So let's look a little bit at the high-level overview of the solution that we designed with EDF. Um, it's a very, uh, very uh, uh, clear pattern, something that we see over and over. The assets are already here. Um, there is already a lot of devices deployed. They already speak uh, with the uh, industry protocols locally. And so in order to connect those devices that are already present, present on the field, uh, we decided to create a, a, an, an additional physical device, a gateway, that gets deployed locally. That's going to be able to connect to the local devices through the different protocol that Amy mentioned earlier, get the data, and use the local compute to clean, aggregate, um, and send the data over to the cloud. And in the cloud, we're going to receive that data, decide whether, we, whether or not we need to act upon it to send alarms or notification, um, store that data, make the raw data available, and then also analyze and process that data, derive insights, and make that process data and those, in those insights also available to a variety of data consumers. And they, those data consumers can be internal to EDF, like data scientists, data analysts, uh, operators, or even maintenance crew, as well as external data consumers um, like maybe third-party owners that might want to look at the performance of their assets or, um, or, or even regulators or things like that. Uh, let's look at what services we, we use during that, uh, that project. So on the edge, um, the gateway that we built is running AWS Greengrass, and that allows us to uh, answer that, that challenge that we have around the wide variety of devices that we have in the field a wide variety of protocols, uh, manufacturers, uh, as well as the different business logic that we might want to run at the edge based on the site of the size or, or things like that. So uh, uh, Greengrass gives us that, uh, that, that, avail that um, flexibility, and it's, it also makes it easier to deploy um, those different uh, parts, the pieces, business logic, or, or protocol adapters at scale, which is also important. Um, for the, for the next phase of the project. And then on the cloud side, so to your right, uh, you will see that uh, AWS IoT Core is our main point of entrance for the data, the, the near real-time data that we're ingesting from the gateway. And from there, uh, it's going to be filtered through our uh, AWS IoT rule engine to decide whether we need to take any, any immediate action on a, on a piece of data um, or if we're just going to send it uh, further down for uh, more processing. 
And if that's the case, then we've elected uh, AWS uh, IoT Analytics to be our main uh, uh, system for, our main service for uh, ingesting, processing, uh, and formatting the data uh, that is then made available for, for consumption for additional processes downstream. So I want to spend a, a little bit of time on each side of the diagram. I'm going to dive deep into the, um, the on, on, on what we build uh, at the edge side, and then I'll come back a little bit at the end on the, on the cloud side of things. So let's, look, let's have a look at what we've built with EDF. First, before the, the, the gateway can actually send any data to the cloud, uh, it needs to be onboarded or bootstrapped. There's different terms for, for describing that, uh, that process. Um, and this, depending on your um, business processes, what manufacturer you, you want to use, are you building your own device or are you buying some device, this process of onboarding can be sometimes pretty complex. Uh, AWS has some features and some tools that can help uh, make it a little bit simpler. And so with EDF, um, we have, we have uh, identified several stages that we need to go through before the, the data can get onboarded. The first one is like a baseline configuration of the hardware. So think of the gateway as just a regular computer. You're going to have to pick uh, an OS. Uh, what, can, uh, you know, what flavor of the OS do you want to use? You might, ha you might want to patch the OS. You might want to configure a local firewall. You might want to install an anti antivirus. Um, you might want to configure DNS settings. Time, time settings are pretty important. We are, we're dealing here with a lot of time series data, so it's, uh, it's pretty critical to have um, accurate time configuration on your device, for example. So that piece of the configuration doesn't really have to do anything with AWS, but it's still something that you need to keep in mind um, when you design uh, that kind of solution. Now, when that happens, the gateway can be actually registered into AWS. So we're going to go into the AWS cloud, register the, the device, generate a certificate to be able to authenticate the device, um, assign a policy to make sure that we can uh, give the right permission to that device and make sure that we use the uh, least privileged principle so that this gateway can only read uh, the device, the data that it needs to read and can only write where it needs to write. Uh, that will allow you to have a much more secure solution and also limit the blast radius whenever you have an incident or, or one of your device gets compromised. So it's pretty important to get that, uh, um, get that really narrowed down as much as possible. There is then uh, some more configuration that needs to happen in the cloud. The, as Amy mentioned, all of, the, all of the sites are very different. Uh, they're going to have different layouts, different protocols, different gear. And so each site being almost unique, we're, we need to capture that. And EDF is building something like a virtual representation of that site in the cloud. And that's going to be deployed um, onto the gateway at, during the onboarding process. So all of that configuration happens in the cloud. That's the, the second part of the process. The third part is to actually deploy everything onto the physical device, onto the gateway. So deploying the certificate and with Greengrass deploying the configuration, as well as the code itself, which is going to run inside Lambdas. Um, that code is going to be stored in the cloud in the AWS Lambda service. And at onboarding, it's going to be deployed locally to the gateway, where we'll be able to run the business logic. I want to spend a little bit of time on talk about the configuration itself. So as I, as I mentioned, the conf configuration is pretty unique uh, to every site. Um, how, how you can store information about the state and the configuration of your device in AWS um, can happen in several ways. The device shadow is a good way to do that. Uh, we started using the device shadow initially uh, to store the, th those kind of configuration with EDF, but quickly ran into one of the limits of the shadow, which is that it cannot go um, beyond that eight kilobytes of data. And so when we're talking about those gateways, we're thinking uh, of um, configuring it to monitor a, a few hundreds or even a few thousand uh, data points with a lot of uh, information about each data points. And so we quickly went above that limit and switched our approach to having a, a flat file, configuration file in JSON to be able to store that configuration. That configuration stores a lot of information about the site. What protocol are, is going to be used to talk to a specific device? Uh, what's the address of that device? If we're using TCP IP, that might be an IP address, or maybe we're using serial um, to talk to that device. A um, lot of information about the field or the, or the values that we're going to read. What type of value are they? Are we reading Booleans or 
integers or floats. Um, expected ranges, right? It's, it's important, uh, Amy mentioned about um, quality of the data and cleaning up of the data. So one way to be able to, um, to do that cleanup is to look at what, what are the expected ranges of the value that we're looking at, right? If we're looking for power or uh, temperature, those might be different, but for uh, temperature, for example, in degrees Celsius, you might want to mention that it, this, uh, this uh, value should never be, I don't know, below minus 50 Celsius and above 120 Celsius or something like that. Anything that's kind of uh, out of that range shouldn't really be considered. Uh, and it's probably a, f a false reading or, or, you, or you have a serious problem. Um, so all of that information is stored in the configuration file, it gets deployed on the gateway during the onboarding. And at that point, the, the gateway uh, knows the layout of the site and is able to start gathering data from the local site, from the, from the solar site. So the way we do that is a pretty simple process called sampling and stacking. Um, on the screen here, you have an example. Let's, see, let's say we're still reading a temperature sensor. We do a sampling every 10 seconds. And in that example, uh, EDF wants to have an aggregated value uh, every one minute. You know, for, this is all configurable through that configuration file. And in, in this example, they only need, for example, um, uh, the, the, the value every one minute. So every 10 seconds, we're going to pull a device, say, say, give me your temperature bring that data back, and then aggregate those six value over a minute, T take just uh, the average of the six value, and that's going to that's gonna be how we build our payload uh, that we send back to the cloud. Now, this is ideal. Uh, in the real world, most of you probably know, like the data is never, it's never that easy, it's never that clean. There's usually some noise. Uh, the data can get dirty. And uh, that's, an that's another example where you can see that, you know, two of the values um, that we sampled are are not what we're expecting for, right? We might have a, uh, a null value because you know, we lost connection to the actual device or it didn't respond to us. And then that last value may be uh, completely out of range and that might be a false reading or, um, or something, something odd that we're getting back. So uh, in order to really build data that we can really rely on, uh, we've built uh, some logic at the edge. So all of this is running on the gateway on the site to actually um, take that into consideration, filter out the data that we don't want to use to build um, the payloads. And so we're going to build the average out of the four samples um, that we have that are uh, correct and discard the other one. And along with that, uh, we're going to add uh, tags to the, to the payload, data quality tags. Um, we built together with EDF uh, a data quality model that we want to do, implement on top of that data. And so we store things as simple as what was the maximum and the minimum um, samples that we got during that one minute. What, how many samples do we actually use to build that aggregate, that uh, average value that we're sending? And what is the standard deviation? Some uh, very uh, typical statistics, um, statistical information. And we're also building a confidence index. So here we have six samples. Four of them are valid, two of them are discarded. It's four out of six, we have 66% confident that this data is, is in good shape. Uh, we can think of you know, the two samples that, that we are missing in this uh, example. Maybe they were a lot higher, maybe they were a lot lower. And so we're not 100% sure that this data is accurate, but uh, we are 66% confident. This is pretty important because th those tags and, and those values they're going to follow the data all the way through the, the whole processing pipeline. So this is getting generated at the edge, and it's going to get ingested in, the, in Adobe IoT, and it's going to follow the data, and it's going to allow EDF to make um, business decisions on top of that data with confidence. Uh, some of those business decisions can have pretty big impact, and so it's going to be very important to know what, how much trust do we have in that data? How much confidence do we have that we're making a decision, um, the right decision based on that data? And if data confidence is low, then we need to look at whether it makes sense or maybe we do further processing to uh, validate the decision or the insight that we get from the data. So let's look a little bit at the summary that we have at the edge so far. We have, we have our, our physical gateway. It's been configured. It's been uh, onboarded onto AWS. We've deployed the configuration onto the gateway. Uh, we've deployed the code, the, the logic that's going to run at the edge. 
so it's able to read the data, stack, and, um, and build the, um, the data quality tagging and, and model that we, that we uh, want on, that, on top of that data. And this is an example payload that gets generated for the data. And you can see, you know, we have a section with a value of a certain field. You know, we're, get, we're sending the average over that one minute period, for example. And then below, we have a DQ, which is data quality, uh, a set of tags, a set of uh, metrics that are associated to that specific reading, um, as, an, as I mentioned, you know, the standard deviation, maximum, minimum, and things like that. And one thing I didn't get into too much details yet is you can see the, the name of that field uh, is a long string of character with, separated by a few dots. This is the IEC 61850 data model that EDF is using. So EDF has done a lot of work over the last few years to re-standardize internally around that, uh, that uh, IEC 61850 standard, which is a, a, a protocol, uh, industry protocol, as well as a, a data model. And you don't really have to know what this, uh, this protocol means. It's, it's, it's a more for the, the power, utility, and energy industry. So if you're not in that in, in an industry, it doesn't really matter. What's important is that you actually think about normalizing your data, making sure that you know uh, how to recognize the data coming from those devices versus coming from something totally different, some totally different processes within your organization, because your, your value-added analytics and machine learning processes are going to depend on you being able to make uh, um, to, to really uh, cross-check those, those different data sources. Um, some of my colleagues that work in the, more in the analytical part of the project, they tend to spend like 80 to 85% of their time when they get to, to a customer to actually clean up data, prepare it, format it, tag it, label it before we can actually get anything out of that data. So during that, uh, that first phase of the project, we spend a lot of time focusing on generating that clean data from the start so that you don't have to um, spend all that time down the line to get to the, base, the business value that's, that's in your data. So IEC 61150 is what EDF is using. Whatever your, your industry is, think about normalizing your data and um, that'll, that'll really help you to get to that value. So now that we have you know, the gateway sending that, that payload, let's look um, a little bit at what we have in the cloud. How are we ingesting that payload? Um, it's going to be going through AWS, um, uh, AWS IoT Core and, uh, and from there into the rule engine for dispatching. And the rule engine is going to look at the message payload and based on some criteria that EDF has defined, um, it's going to decide whether we need to trigger some kind of uh, alerting or notification or, um, or if we're just sending the data along to AWS IoT Analytics. AWS IT Analytics is optimized for time series data, which is great for our use case. It also allows you to process uh, the data through what we call a pipeline. And so you can define um, different steps that you want to go through to clean up, enrich, or, or transform your data. At the moment, we're not using a lot of it in the cloud because we've, um, as I said, we've focused a lot on the processing at the edge site. Um, but that's a possibility that's there. And for that uh, early um, development uh, piece of the project, our data use case was also pretty simple. Um, we decided to look at improving the way EDF does reporting. And so we are ingesting that data and AWS IoT Analytics uh, just presented in a format that is um, being able to be ingested directly into the current EDF uh, reporting process. Those reports used to be done manually and there's a lot of time uh, involved in creating those reports. So this is, uh, this is the value add from, from that initial phase of the project. Obviously, a lot more can be done with the data, um, but I'll talk a little bit more after that. One more thing I want to focus on this slide is the automation part of the backend ingestion system. We spend quite a lot of time um, making sure that everything that we build on, in the cloud uh, can be done uh, automatically and repeatably. The, the idea behind that is, as, as Amy mentioned, um, EDF has assets all over the world, a lot in North America, a lot in Europe, but also in, in other places. And it, it'll make sense at scale to deploy one of those backends in different geographies where the data gets collected. So it's closer to the, to the, to the actual assets. 
And in order to do that from, uh, in a consistent way, uh, we, want, we wanted to make sure that we have a, a way to automate all of, that, uh, all of that deployment. It was not as easy as it sounds because some of our services, uh, like AWS IoT Analytics, are not yet supported by CloudFormation. And so uh, we had to find some work around uh, to do that. And we also work on the automation on the edge side. Again, all of that configuration, uh, the deployment of EOS and the, the configuration. Uh, we spend some time, some time working with Ansible recipes to be able to, de to, de to deploy that um, and uh, enable EDF to have a, an easy way to deploy those gateways at scale when they, when, when they decide to do so. So, as I mentioned, this is you know pretty simple data use case. Um, there's still a lot to be done. I want to spend a, a little bit of time to go back to um, when we had those workshops uh, and we talked, you know, using the working backward me methodology, looking at what we're looking to achieve from those from that project. There's still a lot to be done. Um, what what I've talked about was achieving a five-week uh, uh, rapid POC development, and so down the road. Um, Amy already mentioned, so on the edge side, that EDF is looking at more protocol adapters to read uh, things like DNP3, OPC, DA, um, directly from the gateway, Imp uh, improving the logic, the lambdas that run on the gateway uh, to um, have even more um, tags and labels from the data quality model, managing, uh, managing the hardware itself, like as a um, system administrator, logging in remotely into those gateways. Uh, EDF is also thinking of using uh, AWS Systems Manager as a way to simplify the way um, you can remotely log in into those devices. And then on the cloud side, um, implementing uh, AWS IoT Device Defender to tighten the security uh, around, the, around the gateway itself and, uh, and monitoring what the, the, what the gateway uh, behavior is and, and being able to flag a gateway that's out of its behavior. Um, updating the uh, automation part whenever uh, all the services and all the features uh, become supported within CloudFormation. On the AWS IoT analytics, uh, something like detection of stale value or false readings before they get ingested in the downstream processes, as well as backfilling the data if you have a, an outage or loss of communication um, all of that right now is done manually. Okay, again, very time-consuming uh, processes. So being able to automate that within the cloud would be a, um, a good advantage for, for EDF. And as I said, uh, you know, feeding that data into a lot more complex analytics, as well as machine learning processes to really extract the value of the, the data. Uh, now that we are able to, uh, con to, to generate and consume uh, that clean tagged data from the gateway is going to be also in the next steps. And then further down the line, integrating all of those um, alerts, insights, and, and access to the data through the um, operations control centers. So this is the room where you know, operators are physically there, uh, having control over the assets, being able to change set points on, on, on a site or, or restart an inverter or something like that. Uh, this is also what, look, what EDF is looking at uh, doing down the road maybe even further uh, using the gateway as a mean to control some of those assets um, even further down the road. So I want to thank Amy and EDF. It's been a really, a really fun uh, project to work with, a re really fun team to work with as well. Uh, I'm really excited to see what EDF is going to build on top of th those foundations. Uh, and I'll uh, give the stage back to Amy, who's going to talk to you about some lesson learned and business results. So thanks, Matt, for the very thorough technical explanation. Um, so yeah, I'm going to share just a few lessons learned uh, from this collaboration during a proof of concept. Uh, some of them we've already gone over uh, very briefly, um, others at length, but uh, let's re-emphasize them. Uh, the first lesson learned is, of course, uh, infrastru infrastructure automation doesn't always keep up with the fast-paced changes to AWS services. Uh, we had to implement some workarounds uh, with a combination of both cloud formation templates, CLI scripting, and rule provisioning. But there is always a way of, there's always a workaround. Um, the second lesson learned is the fact that configuring hardware outside of the cloud environment to
to support cloud native services such as Greengrass requires an orchestration tool, something that allows you to provision both the hardware and also the cloud um, device management piece. Uh, so we used Ansible uh, as this orchestration tool. Um, also, the last uh, bullet point on this slide is uh, me stating the obvious, but uh, just uh, re-emphasizing it is the fact that a proof of concept, of course, does not answer all questions for deployment at scale, but it does give us a more clear and robust pathway uh, forwards towards that. Uh, in line with that, uh, I think it's important to start small, uh, keep the big picture in mind. In our specific case, some of the elements of the big picture are, for example, the fact that some of our sites already have local computation capabilities. That's something that we totally took out of the picture for the proof of concept because we needed to make some choices. So there's, of course, a question of whether we would be able to deploy the gateway as a virtual gateway within a virtual machine or a container on, on that local computational capability that we already have. A second point is that we need to be able to ensure end-to-end uh, -end data privacy because that's one of our in, uh, internal requirements. And so that's something that we have not addressed uh, so far. Uh, the second uh, element here is one that uh, Matt has gone over many times, but I really want to insist on it, is the fact that data architecture and data normalization are really key. Um, otherwise, well, your data lake will be a data swamp, something that we've heard over and over again, but it's really true. Uh, we obviously, as a utility, have used a utility-specific uh, solution, uh, which is the IEC 61850 set of communication protocols, which also hosts a data model. Uh, but um, there are, whatever your industry, uh, think uh, really carefully about the data normalization piece. Uh, and lastly is the fact that um, although this proof of concept had the goal of, of course, making the jobs of some of our collaborators easier, and automating some tasks, the fact is that it is going to change their day-to-day, -day. and so uh, digital disruption is real. Sometimes, well, it can be a positive increment, and generally it is a positive increment, but you have to think very carefully of change management and how it's going to be managed throughout all the layers of the organization, and not just at the top and the bottom. Um, in terms of business results, so I think um, I hope the message is clear, is the fact that we've demonstrated that AWS's managed services around IoT are suitable for the business requirements that we were looking at. We managed to demonstrate that through a proof of concept of five weeks, uh, which is uh, very fast, especially for a big organization like us. Uh, we deployed one test device to one test site. Um, so this is really in line with the idea of starting small, thinking big. Uh, the proof of concept was small, both in terms of deployment and in terms of feature set but we now have a clear pathway to getting to that robust rollout plan. What are the questions that we need answered for that deployment at scale, and how do we get to that full feature set? We have also identified what the cybersecurity best practices and recommendations would look like when we're starting to extend out our, our cloud right to the grid edge. So the next steps for us um, look like this. Uh, we uh, need to think about uh, validating the architecture that we demonstrated during this proof of concept um, of course, through the lessons learned and through what we tested through the proof of concept, we've realized there's other doors that need to be opened, other pathways that might need to be looked at. And so we think we need to think about how this architecture can work for deployment at scale. What does it mean in terms of skill sets, both internally and externally, and what partners can help us with that? Next phase would be industrialization, meaning designing the hardware, because we were using just a test hardware during this proof of concept. So we would need to think about what uh, hardening and de developing that hardware uh, so that it's production ready, and how are we going to do the multi-device management, because for the moment we're dealing with one site, as I mentioned. And finally, of course, the idea would be to arrive at a steady state where we've got a full-scale deployment that we're managing and uh, with production grade, both hardware and software. And so I just want to uh, insist again on the fact that the fact of having next steps for a proof of concept doesn't mean the proof of concept has failed. On the contrary, it means that we've got a very clear understanding of what next steps we need to go through um, and secure the business value. So finally, uh, we were really wanting to look as a company at what taking control of, well, sorry, what taking control over the edge logic meant for us. Uh, so that's why we focus so, so heavily on data quality and data normalization. 
uh, your data analytics are only as good as your data. <laughs> uh, the data is the building block of your data lake. And so that's what we really wanted to try and explore when we take control over that edge piece. What would it mean for us? Um, we, this is only one small piece of everything that's been going on uh, within the company, as I mentioned. Uh, we are building a cloud-based digital infrastructure um, because we really believe that uh, having the flexible infrastructure to support us in our global services is the way we have to go in order to be competitive today and remain competitive in the future. Uh, so with this, I hope that uh, it's given you a good overview of how we implemented AWS IoT and also the lessons learned through a proof of concept. And uh, I close, well, I'll close this session and uh, open up to questions now. Yeah, I had um, actually a twofold question. First of all, what's the volume of data you think you'll be handling in this system when it's built out? Uh, yeah, in the multi gigawatts, uh, multi gigabytes. Sorry. <laughs> Is that a per day, per week? Per uh, per, no, per per every time we pull the information. Okay. Um, okay. Great. Thanks. And then the second thing is, do you have sort of like a, a like data warehouses or some sort of analytic structure? that's in place right now, and how do you, what is that, and how do you think you might evolve that to allow it to process this data? Uh, so yeah, indeed, we have already got some data warehouse solutions for the other ways of bringing our data in. So we've got a Pi connector, OSI Pi connector, because we've got a lot of our data that's in OSI Pi. So we're delivering that data directly into our AWS cloud with some downstream processing using uh, lambdas that are triggered, and we've got uh, both Redshift and RDS uh, in there. Um, and yeah, that's one of the ways of us uh, connect, getting that data. Another way, for example, for big wind is that we're connecting directly to the SCADA of the um, wind uh, turbine manufacturers. And so we're pulling the data from the SQL database and uh, harvesting that and bringing that into our, and into our uh, cloud environment. But indeed, there is a question of how are we going to deal in long term with the coexistence of this IoT pipeline and the other pipeline that we have. Um, this was a proof of concept. We wanted to see um, experimenting all the IoT services, how they uh, work together and how it would fit our business requirements. But we haven't thought about how are we going to integrate them downstream uh, yet? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would like to ask uh, uh, in which way do you connect the onboard devices with the cloud? Uh, with, the, with the cloud? Do you base on LTA technology, GSM, or fiber optics in the solar system power plants? That's going to depend on the different assets, right? So the one we, the one we worked out with, the, uh, there's just network uh, in place, like um, um, least, least uh, line between the, 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 the site itself and, uh, and the, the core networking of EDF, so it's kind of easy. The, some of those assets are going to be pretty remote, so I don't know in that case if, you, if there is different kind of, of technology. But for that point of proof of concept, we took like an, a, an easier approach with a, a site that was already connected. I don't know, Amy, if you want to. Yeah, so most of our sites are directly connected to Hello? OK. <laughs> uh, most of our sites are directly connected to our data centers. Uh, however, there are some sites uh, where we have that question of how are we going to, well, the network piece as well that we need to solve, because there's currently no connectivity at all. Um, and so in those cases, yeah, we'll need to figure out what type of communication uh, device we'll need to set up. But yeah, we're trying to solve the, the volume. And regarding this topic, uh, this kind of, of implementation regarding communication is on board on the device, or do you, uh, this device is completely independently of the communication system? Yeah, that, that, that might be depending on your use case, right? You can think of both. Uh, some, some of, you know, we've, div we've I've worked with other customers and deployed maybe like LoRa uh, kind of solution where you could have a, a, the LoRa receiver or transmitter directly on your gateway, or you might have a completely separate uh, 
transmission device, maybe like a satellite uh, link or something like that, and then you know locally you would have a, a Ethernet or something like that to to get to that uh, that network gateway if you want. Hi. So I was curious what your approach is to normalizing the data that you already have coming in through other legacy SCADA systems. Like you said, you have stuff coming in through Pi. You think you'll retag it then to get it all into the IEC standard? Yes. So we're doing that. We 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 firmly believe that. Um, that's the way we can make sure that all analytics that we're deriving can be applied across all data streams. Um, and so, yes, we're already normalizing the data to IEC 61850, no matter the, the data stream. So that's happening in the cloud and on the edge. Right, adding on to that, are you expecting to replace Pi? with this solution going forward? <laughs> or are you going to use Pi as your source? The question worth a million dollars. <laughs> um, so that's a bit of a tricky question, uh, because that comes into the organizational transformation, people piece, and uh, process changes. Um, I don't think we'll be ripping out Pi. Uh, let's be clear. Um, I mean, there's so many assets where we've got OSI Pi installed and servers that are installed, uh, and it just doesn't make economical sense to take that out uh, now if, when it's been amortized, uh, amortized for multiple years already. Um, however, the question is really for new assets, and uh, we are exploring other ways of bringing in data from those other assets uh, without having to use Pi. So I have a question about, um, I'm not, it's not clear whether you have any federal agencies as your customers. Uh, if you do, have you thought through the compliance process for federal sites? If yes, for how does the cloud model fit in the federal agencies? So we fall under NERC compliance in North America, um, which is for, uh, it's basically for any uh, utility scale asset that's connected to the transmission system. Uh, so that's why we've made the strong commitment to only uh, bring in operational data and not asset identification data, and also uh, to not allow communication back down from the cloud towards the grid edge. Uh, so, but that's a big challenge uh, because generally, um, yeah, federal agencies and cloud um, don't always go hand in hand, or it's, it's a process. Hi, I'm from OSSoft. Hopefully you guys are not going to replace it. <laughs> <laughs> so we are working with AWS. So we are trying to run our connectors on the green, on the green grass itself. And uh, we have an integrator now available, which is ETL tool. So you can uh, stream the data to S3 Kinesis for streaming on Redshift as well. Mm. Ah, very good. Good to know, yeah. Hi. You mentioned that you are going to uh, further down the line to work on the machine learning. Do you have already thought of use cases and the uh, kind yeah, so of architecture on SageMaker or so on? So architecture, no. Uh, use cases, yes. Um, we've already got some use cases that are in with, within our research and development teams. Uh, one of them is, for instance, to um, identify um, aging uh, degradation of solar assets. Um, through, machi well, through machine learning. Uh, and another other one is also to be able to uh, detect uh, soiling rates on our solar assets uh, by uh, cr well, cross-referencing the information, uh, the operational information with uh, also meteorological information. So we've already got some algorithms that are uh, ready, uh, just not in our cloud. Uh, there's also a lot of other cases like um, um, image recognition, because uh, uh, on our solar assets we do fly over with uh, drones or, or um, uh, planes to take uh, infrared uh, images of the assets. And so that's something that would be definitely uh, useful to uh, bring in as well, uh, to identify any defects on our solar assets. So plenty of use cases. I, what would you say would your top three challenges be when implementing the POC? Thanks. For the POC specifically? Uh, 
signing a contract. No. <laughs> 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 uh, no, I'm just joking, but not really. Uh, no, during the, P the POC, honestly, everything uh, went really smoothly because I think there was so much that was defined up front um, that um, it can only go uh, well uh, when, when you sort of know what you're targeting and that uh, everybody's got their expectations sort of set. Uh, within the organization, though, more generally, uh, I'd say really the people piece, uh, but that's normal. I mean, any company going through this change uh, will see that the people piece is, is quite challenging. Yeah. Yeah, I would, I would uh, emphasize, you know, defining very clearly what you're trying to achieve during, especially if you're going through rapid, in, rapid, uh, iteration and rapid cycles is, is critical, right? Because we started very high level, you know, drafting a PR FAQ, thinking of this big product and, and all the features that could be in there. And then we kind of narrowed that down and narrowed that down and narrowed that down. Um, and that's really key to set the expectation right across the business, even, you know, working in partnership uh, between ProServe and EDF. Um, because if you don't do that, you might start with the, uh, uh, with the idea that in, you know, in five weeks or eight weeks, you're gonna be able to deploy uh, at scale a production ready solution, which is not realistic. So you know, making sure that you're setting up your expectation, working, down the, 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 the working backward process is very good and it, it really allows you to look at what you, you know, what's your main features, what, what do you really wanna focus on or what are points that are completely open that you don't know what you wanna do. And this is, this, this, these are the kind of use cases that you want to put in your proof of contact or, or your first couple of iteration um, because you want to prove something, you want to validate an architecture, you want to answer a, a, a very critical question on whether you're doing it this way or that way. And I think that's, uh, uh, that's pretty critical to get, uh, to get right. more right, great great thank you very much for this uh, one question on the uh, provenance of the data uh, based upon the value of this and the importance of, of the information that you're collecting when you have it at scale do you uh, have any other plans for uh, additional security and proof of provenance of the of the information that you're collecting or are you allowing for what's embedded in the in the basically the green the green grass system and, and the IoT infrastructure? Uh, so in the cybersecurity best practices and recommendations that we uh, worked on during this proof of concept, um, it actually goes much further than uh, just what's embedded in green grass or the services that are already available um, from AWS. And so yes, there's definitely a, a lot of inf of um, um, elements that would need to be done on the actual uh, device itself um, and making sure that, uh, for instance, uh, not anybody can just log in and uh, control it, <laughs> for example. So uh, uh, that's one of the elements. I don't know whether... Yeah, it is it something we didn't really emphasize too much, but we had a whole cybersecurity stream along with the POC. And so we took kind of like the... Um, a baseline approach with the, the, the features and the security features that are already here uh, in all of our AWS services. And along with that, look at the NERC SIP requirements uh, that uh, EDF would have to comply with and kind of um, create like a, a best practice and recommendation of what do we need to do on top of that. So same thing, it's, it's, it's all about setting the expectation on what we're gonna accomplish during uh, that initial deployment that might not be fully compliant or, or meeting every single point of, 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 uh, of your cybersecurity expectations, but also having a roadmap and saying, okay, we know that we need to improve here or there or deploy something additional like the um, AWS IoT device defender that I talked about uh, that's, gonna, that's gonna solve a few of the challenges. Um, but we decided not to focus on that during the POC. It's going to come down the line. Understood. Thank you. I just didn't see it in the uh, no, that's fine. In that's the okay. Thanks there. for your Thank question. You. Hi. So on the gateway side, you showed the architecture and the connection to the physical assets. And there's a layer that translates the Modbus or whatever protocols are there to the green grass and sends it out to the cloud. But when you go at scale, there's a variety of different devices that you will need to connect to. So how do you approach it technically when it comes to 
supporting a lot of different devices uh, protocols. So the idea when we go at scale is to um, use that configuration file, that's, that's a, the, the virtual or logical representation of a specific site, and this, this configuration is going to have the information, okay, this site is using only Modbus, or it's using Modbus and GNP3, or, um, and that's going to allow us to, at provisioning of a specific gateway, deploy the different uh, translator or, or protocol adapters that we need so that the, the gateway is a, actually able to communicate, uh, and also deploy the, the business logic uh, parts of it to be able to um, you know, clean up the data, add the, 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 the additional data quality model based on um, protocol A or B or C. Th does that answer your question? So if I happen to be a developer interested in working on um, projects such as this, are you guys hiring? <laughs> <laughs> Nick. Nick is, Nick is part of the team that worked on the, <laughs> on the project. So, yes. <laughs> All right, we have a couple more minutes if any of you guys have any more questions. So, in this uh, POC, how are you guys converting DNP to MQTT? You had to write your own adapter? Yes, so that's, that's going to be the, 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 the code that we deploy within Greengrass that's going to act as a protocol adapter. Uh, for our proof of concept, we focused on Modbus, um, and so the, this code that we developed is able to go pull uh, Modbus register, get the data, uh, do that um, you know, data cleanup and aggregation that I showed, and then convert that into a piece of JSON that is then uh, being sent over MQTT by the, uh, by the Greengrass core. Um, so I wanted to understand a little bit about, you're saying that you've done this proof of concept now and that you're going to go forward and kind of get the approvals and business value, but then you also talked about working in a scaled agile, kind of, well, tailored scale agile organization. So is it just a proof of concept that you've scaled up and now you don't have any more, or is it the start of building the strategic service for EDF? So the Scaled Agile is, uh, was more a comment on all the other initiatives that are going on. Uh, so we do have uh, some uh, product development teams both in uh, Europe, France, and in the US. Uh, so I think it's like six or seven product development teams uh, working uh, currently. So that's where we're using the Scaled Agile framework. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're still increasing the number of products that will be in 2019. Um, and so it's something that's going to, in the long term, uh, maintained and continued. But on this uh, actual proof of concept, uh, currently we're trying to think about what the best next step is for it, um, which is, yeah, as I mentioned, we've got a lot of uh, questions that need to, to be answered. Uh, we learned a lot from the proof of concept, um, and the next steps are still to be decided. And we started it from the, the, the working backwards PRFAQ um, process. So that, that, mean, that means that really before even doing the, P, the POC, we were really focused on what business value are we trying to achieve and really clearly de defining what product do we want to launch. And I think this, you know, this is a big part of uh, if you're looking for you know, getting support or getting funding or something like that, this is, this is really important to focus on that as a start so that you know that whatever you're building down the road has a business, uh, business value. And then, you know, maybe the POC uh, learnings makes you realize that you don't want to go that way, you want to go another way. That's, still, that's fine. You can, you can pivot and, and adjust, but you know that what you're building from the start answers the need of your customers, whether they're external or internal customers, uh, and that you really have business, business value coming out of that project. Yeah, I just wondered if um, you, were, you were going to be incrementally then delivering that value to customers across the business, starting with your proof of concept and then increasing that outwards, but it sounds like, it sounds like you're, you've done the proof of concept, you've tested a load of ideas, and you're now almost going for the full, full scale, this is what we want to do across everywhere. And I've just wondered if you'd thought about doing that more incrementally, that was all. Yeah, the, the, I think, I think the, the goal is to increment on top of the POC, right? It's, it's not a disposable, uh, a disposable piece of work. Cool. All of it might not be um, reused at scale, mm -hmm. um, but it's something that we want to build upon, I think. Thank you. All right. 
Uh, thanks everyone for, for coming today. Uh, enjoy the rest of your week and please uh, complete the session survey on your app. And uh, I hope uh, to see you guys around soon. We'll probably hang out a little bit outside if uh, some of you have more, uh, more questions after the, this session. Thank you.